Hello, this is Sherry Beaver with South Carolina Department of Education, and we are here today to present to you part one of the South Carolina Transcripts and Procedures webinar. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Laura McNair, Louise Amos, and I believe also Josh Roof is helping us out in some part today. Um, he may be in part two, but we are all here to help um, you with some information about um, transcripts and procedures. So we're excited to present some topics to you today. Um, transcribing transcripts and the toolkit that goes with that. We are going to have a bunch of resources for you to um, have in your arsenal. We also will have some information about international transcripts and some updates that um, you can use to help with those foreign transcripts. We will also be talking with you about some reminders of the uniform grading policy um, sections, certain sections, and then um, also later in the part, you will talk, we'll talk about proper coding, finalizing and archiving transcripts, early graduate transcripts, an update on the closing date for this year's transcript because of the late date starting school this year, and then also transcript template and proper procedures. So I want to start out talking uh, with counselors out there who typically your job, part of that job is to transcribe transcripts as students come in and also looking at checking transcripts for accuracy. So uh, you have several things that you need at your fingertips um, as you um, do this, these particular duties. Um, so I have um, organized a counselor toolkit for transcript um, transcription. And so um, at the bottom of this slide, you will see a Padlet link. And that Padlet link will take you to a landing page where I have um, organized and downloaded several documents that will help you um, develop that toolkit. Um, as you can see, the asterisks um, on the first few bullet points, those are documents that are loaded onto that Padlet page. So let's just go through these and talk about each one briefly. So as you are transcribing transcripts, um, one of the things that will help you is if you have a transcription form. And I have included on the Padlet page an example of a transcription form. And again, this may be something that you already have that your school or district has already approved for you to use. So um, if, if not, though, there is a sample um, that you can utilize to um, tailor to your needs. And that, that was actually shared with me and um, from Lucy Beckham High School in Mount Pleasant. Um, and they gave me permission to share that with you and you are able to adapt that for your use. And then also a credit check form that allows you to look at and evaluate your transcripts, um, not only just transferring students, but all of your students in your caseload to look at the required credits for graduation and the categories of courses, different things that you might want to keep up with as you assess that transcript. And there is a sample of that form on the Padlet page as well. Again, your district or school may already have an approved form, um, but if not, you can look at this as a possible template. And then I have also downloaded the uniform grading policy and the administrative procedures document. So you'll have that all in one place on that Padlet page. And then also a copy of the current South Carolina Department of Ed activity coding manual. And then copies of state and district memos are also important to keep up with. Now, I have downloaded one memo on my Padlet page. I'll talk about that later. But locally, sometimes you will also have local board policies different guidance that comes in through memos from Department of Ed and also even CHEs, the Michigan Higher Ed, have different policies and memos that come out sometimes that affect um, your students in high school, uh, specifically state scholarship information. So any of those items that you can collect and put in a binder or in a central location on a Google Doc or something like that, that is always good to have in your department for everyone to have reference and, and to refer back to. So I just wanted to make mention of those items. So if you take all of those together, that helps you begin the formation of your counselor toolkit. So again, that Padlet page is going to include um, multiple documents and items um, that I mentioned here. And as we go forward, you'll see some additional ones. So in the transcription evaluation, I want to give you an overarching procedure 
that we would start looking at that umbrella view, um, that overarching view of how do you start with evaluating procedures um, in different steps. Well, first of all, you start at your local level at the bottom of that pyramid with any procedures and guidelines that your local district and school may issue, policy, and then it would go up to also including any information about laws at the federal or state level that may affect um, students coming into your school. One example of this is the South Carolina Compulsory Education Law. And I have included the link to that law if you want to read through the entire um, law. That's section 596320. And this um, relates to the age of attendance for school for students to enter public schools in South Carolina. And as you can see, it is not lawful for any person to be less than five or more than 21 years old to attend public school in South Carolina, and that includes kindergarten. But there, there could be some court ordered exceptions. That is not to say certain things can't have exceptions made, but I certainly um, am not the one to tell you about exceptions that would come from some other higher source probably a court or something like that. But right now, the, this is the law that we are using as the basis um, for enrollment in our schools. And of course, you have your local district attendance zones um, that um, have um, power to kind of uh, in include different uh, guidelines for enrollment as well. Now, there are some essential questions that you need to ask when you start looking at transcripts to make um, that transcription. One is, first of all, the school year that you're, you're coming, the student is coming in and what school year did they leave their previous school? What country did they leave? Um, what grade level or the equivalent grade level were they? What was the grading scale from the sending school? What courses most um, match or best match the courses that they took? And then of course, you so say you would need those course names and a few other pieces of information we'll talk about in a minute. And then also the hours they spent in courses, because generally um, certain, uh, especially in, in um, international schools, those um, number of hours or minutes spent in classes may not match exactly your, what we, we spend here. So you would have to know that information in order to look at it, evaluating the amount of credit. So let's talk about one of the recent things that we have just found out about that could guide you in some good information to have as you go forward toward the end of the semester, you're going to start looking at closing out those transcripts. So I did want to throw this in before we get deeper into looking at some details, is that the South Carolina Commission on Higher Ed has issued um, or getting ready to issue a memo that will give um, the new closing date for the 2021 school year will now be for this year, and of course this is this year only because of the late start dates and the late closing dates for this year, they are allowing those um, dates on those closing transcripts to be on or before June 30th of 2021. Normally it is June 15th, but this year because of the later closing dates of schools, they have extended that, and so for to be able to comply, um, to qualify for state scholarships, those students' um, transcripts should have a date on or before June 30th. So that gives a little breathing room for schools that are closing later this year. And it is important to remember that failure to comply with this deadline can affect your students from qualifying for state scholarships. So that's a very, that's why I put this in bold print here, that you realize that that date is extended this year, but only this year only um, that we know of right now. Now let's talk about certain types of um, transcriptions that you may be involved with. One of the things that you have to sometimes look at is if a student is on a diploma versus a non-diploma track. So when you are evaluating a transcript, um, you are looking at different um, types of activity codes and course codes. So for non-diploma students, there are different options that certain districts um, offer. Some districts offer a certificate of attendance for those non-diploma students. And then the state of South Carolina Department of Ed um, began having this new um, credential called the South Carolina High School Credential. Um, and that website is 
um, listed there and you can click on that. It takes you to a whole resource of, of other um, resources you can use. Um, and so I just wanted to include that. One of the main things that we also want to point out is non-diploma students, um, even though they have their own course codes and you're going to be seeing those show up on the transcript, is that they are, however, excluded from class rank. So whenever you're running class rank for a semester or year in for storing, um, or just running it in general for the end of a semester, you will always need to remember to exclude those non-diploma students from class rank. Now, early graduates are another category of students, and Louise and, and Laura Bates will touch on this a little later, um, more a deep dive more into this, but um, again, this is asterisk on there because that early graduation guide is downloaded on that pilot page. So that guide can help um, take you through some procedures that will help you identify when to include or exclude students from class rank because it does depend on when they are finishing as to whether you include or exclude. So as you look at bullet three and four, you will see that anybody in that graduating cohort in the spring will be included in class rank. Um, so that would nor be your normal graduation class in when it, end of May, 1st of June, which is usually when it is, but it may be a little later this year, but that spring cohort includes those graduates in class rank. But any other time, if a student finishes in the winter, or let's say at the end of first semester or uh, summer, those students that graduate at different times other than the spring are excluded from class rank. And that is all in that graduation guide. So make sure you look at those instructions as well as the coding um, instructions that are in there um, so that you can make sure that all of that is coded correctly. And again, Laura and, and Louise may touch upon that a little later. I do want to address the question we get a lot is pertains to potential and earned credits that you see um, displayed on transcript. One of the things we need to make sure you understand is that all courses that a student enrolls in is a potential credit. Um, so if they are in a class past that drop ad date, which is usually early on, you know, a, there's a limit of time where they can drop ad. So if they go past that, they are enrolled in the class and can get a potential credit, except for audits. Audits are a little different in because they're, they're um, being approved by special process, and they are basically observing the class, and they are not receiving a grade, so therefore they're technically not an enrolled student for a credit. So audits are the exception, but all other course enrollments, including initial credit courses, retakes, and credit recovery attempts, all are potential credits. All courses and grades will remain on that transcript um, and show all those potential and earned credits on that transcript, even the middle school grades, remember that changed a few years ago in the UGP, middle school grades all stay on the transcript, even if they retake those courses, they stay on, and then we'll talk about what happens in a minute. But earned credit, so if you have earned credit, sometimes, depending on what's going on with the situation, you may have to go in and make some manual additions or, or removing earned credits, let's say for credit recovery or for a retake, then you would have to adjust the earned credit because you only get one earned credit per course code. Um, so, you know, that, that course code, if you repeat that course or do a credit recovery, you can only get one earned credit. So you may have to go in and follow some of the directions on how to, to, to adjust that. In power school, and again, Laura and Louise may touch on that a little later in the procedures or in part two of this webinar. Now, every year we tend to get a few issues where transcripts have been stored and they have um, an error sometimes in the stored transcript at the end of the school year. So, like in the summer, someone will call and say, you know, this course did accidentally that grade didn't get on or this course was um, not included, something happened and something didn't get included and there was an error. Anytime that happens on a set of stored transcripts, especially those, those year-end stored transcripts, you have to consult your district person that's involved with 
with PowerSchool and transcripts, as well as Department of Ed in order to get corrections made. So just wanted to make sure you're aware of that. In terms of retaking courses versus credit recovery, and in terms of transcripts, follow the UGP guidelines that are given in each section inside the UGP. For example, credit recovery in the UGP, it, it tells you exactly what to do. Um, if a student takes credit recovery and they pass it, they get a P. If they don't, they get an NP. And they are only gonna get one, one earned credit, but they will have two potential credits. So that is um, the, because they were potentially getting they had to go back and redo some sections and therefore they get that potential credit for that re, um, credit recovery. That failing grade is going to be excluded and the P is going to be awarded with a credit. And remember, there is a time limit on credit recovery. You must complete that credit recovery within one academic year. In other words, um, if you fail a class in semester one, you have until the end of the next semester, one of the next year, so two full um, semesters to retake that credit recovery, to do that credit recovery, or there's also a special session sometimes in the summer where districts offer summer um, summer uh, opportunities, and those summer deadlines are also spelled out in the UGP about that. On retakes, um, let's jump down there. There's a section in the UGP about that. Again, you're only going to get one earned credit, but you may have multiple potential credits depending on the number of times that the retake is attempted. Um, so you would just, just FYI, that potential credit always is there because you have uh, attempted that course multiple times possibly. So also remember that all course attempts and the grades remain on the transcript and only the highest grade point value is included in the GPA. And you are to exclude from the GPA, all the retake grades that have the lower point value. And therefore, there are some procedures that Louise and Laura may touch on, as well as part two may touch on some of this as well, um, as far as the how-to procedures inside PowerSchool. Retakes are, the, uh, uh, are supposed to be the same course at the same level of difficulty. However, there are, uh, there's at least one exception that is spelled out in the UGP, and that is if a student fails a course at a certain level and it's not offered the next year, then that is an exception. And students um, are allowed to receive administrative approval to retake it at a different level of difficulty and still count it as a retake. However, that's um, the only case that's spelled out as an exception. Now let's talk about international transcripts. We get a lot of information or a lot of questions actually about um, international transcripts and foreign credits. So I'm trying to help walk you through a few overview things about international transcripts. One of the things that we are working to update is a memo from 2010 that talked about some guidance um, from the State Department of Ed on evaluating and awarding credits from, for, from foreign cre uh, transcripts. This will probably be updated in the next you know, year or so. But for now, that particular document is downloaded on the Padlet page for your reference. For now, you can use that as guidance. But again, that may change, um, and Laura may talk about that later, um, that that update may take place pretty soon. But anyway, for now, that is there. Also, please remember that anytime you get a foreign transcript, you know, a lot of times we have to seek additional information. Um, including that parent and student in that conversation if possible, even if through an interpreter, to try to get information directly from the parents and students about different courses, different things that they um, tell you about what they covered in certain courses is always helpful. But you can also, of course, use your internet search to get information about the foreign country, the type of system, and also seeking information from the sending school itself, either through an email or phone conversation or from looking at their website as well. Sometimes you can find course syllabus, a course syllabus on there um, on the web, or the student may actually have a copy of something that they put with them. Um, one of the things that you often will find as a helpful tool is if uh, the documents or the transcript comes with what we call assessment scores, 
or end of course assessments that that, that where they are awarded uh, a final uh, assessment score um, that shows what they um, accomplished and the level of accomplishment. So a lot of times that is helpful information. Another question that we often get is how do you translate a foreign language that's Sanskrit? And a lot of times that the, the, there are services available that will help you with that. Uh, the district will purchase uh, subscriptions for, for help with that. Sometimes um, you, you may have to actually use the courtesy version, which is the Google Translate. And sometimes that can help you with that if you need that. Um, so that's just some um, information as a resource there in case you need it. But the main thing is at the end of the day, when you finish, you want that uh, student to have his or her courses closely as possible match something in the in the South Carolina grading system. So that is your ultimate goal in um, in, in transcribing. And consistency is key in doing that. So if you're looking at a district-wide um, version of, of how to help do this, we suggest, first of all, that your district uh, designate someone to assist the schools um, that can be the go-to person. And that way that, that adds consistency to coaching and advisement about transcripts in your district. And then we also suggest that your district adopt an appeal protocol that allows parents, students to make appeals um, regarding their transcript, trans, translation, transcription. Um, and, and this just helps um, them to have a way to voice additional or add additional information um, if they need to, to make sure they are getting um, the credit that they feel like they deserve. And um, this is all very um, consistent with the information that I gleaned from an international transcript webinar. Um, so I, I want to give credit to this particular organization, PL Grant and Associates um, out of Atlanta. They are International Transcript Evaluator Service, and they supply resources to schools and districts. So. This is a helpful link that may take you to some additional resources, so I wanted to include that there. And finally, I wanted to show you this chart that was included in that webinar that I was just talking about. This is the International Education System chart that shows you the U.S. equivalent, and then across the board, looking at some of the major um, areas uh, of foreign countries that you may receive students um, in, in enrollment from France, United Kingdom, and Central America, and it shows you the equivalent grade levels. Uh, I just thought it was a neat chart, and it's a good thing to put in that toolkit um, or a binder somewhere or a Google Doc somewhere to have that available for your um, access. So with that, I feel like I've done sort of an umbrella approach. Now what we're going to do is do a deeper dive, and I'm going to turn this over to um, Laura McNair. She is my um, colleague over in the Office of um, Accountability. So Laura, go ahead and take over. Hi, I'm Laura McNair. Um, the first screen I have is the graduation requirements. Um, which is part of Regulation 43-234. Um, as you will see, you have four units of English and four units of math. And dual enrollment classes will count towards those graduation requirements. Also, some colleges require foreign language. So underneath Kate and foreign language credit, you may want to get the student to check um, which colleges that they may be applying to to see what they need. Also with the computer science course, the activity coding manual, which is ACM in the parentheses, appendix Q there um, will show you which courses are acceptable. And physical education or um, JROTC count as one unit. And I'm trying to get to the next slide. Okay. 
Okay. This slide is from the activity coding manual. It shows the um, health education requirements, which is regulation 43238 course codes. Physical education one that's in the middle, 3441, that is the course code that counts as the physical education graduation credit. It cannot have honors weight. Down below, you will see physical education two, three, and four with the course codes. These can count as elective credits. Um, many athletes take um, a physical education credit each year. I've seen transcripts that have the same course code for four years in a row. Please do not do that. Use the separate course codes. Also with health, um, if you have a separate health class, then those are the codes that need to be used. If it's included in a high school or freshman 101 class, make sure that there's a certified health teacher teaching that portion of the course. Luis is going to show um, several slides that have the fields for accurate transcripts. However, this is just a cheat sheet that I send my counselors and principals to show exactly what I'm looking for on transcripts because many, many, many times um, the transcripts are missing common elements. Um, please do not tell students that the Department of Education houses student transcripts. I get phone calls every week, dozens of phone calls with students telling me that they tried to go to their former high school for a transcript and was told that I could provide them with one. We do not house them. Schools and districts are required to keep records for 75 years. Do not run a transcript off of PowerSchool. When I ask for one, it must be the stored transcript. Oftentimes, when one is run off the power school, the principal signature is missing, as well as the upper right hand corner. Instead of the district name and school name, it says graduated student. For dual credit, districts must develop detailed agreements with um, partner institutions of higher education. It doesn't matter if it's a two year or four year college or technical college. But the courses, the instructors, all must be outlined clearly with detailed procedures, including the grade scale differences. Many times there are grade scale differences. Every single year, this must be updated and signed. Students may not take college courses on their own time without first consulting the district to determine if the course is part of the agreement between the high school and the institution. Furthermore, if a student takes a dual credit course, that course must be entered into the PowerSchool scheduler before the student takes the course. Um, you can refer to page three of the activity coding manual for more information on institutions of higher education and dual credit courses. For dual enrollment courses, um, again, it's imperative that a district or school does not request a course code for a dual enrollment class after a student begins the class. Nicole Ivory um, in my office is the one who um, creates the course codes. And if you need a dual enrollment course code, um, their link is on there, the request for addition form. You can fill that out and send it to her. Also, um, before you request a new course code, please look for equivalents. The second bullet says that public speaking has four equivalent course codes, so please check on those. The Algebra 1 credit, this is extremely important. Students must not enroll in the Foundations and Algebra course prior to ninth grade. And a school that offers foundations in algebra must offer intermediate algebra right after it. If they complete foundations in algebra successfully, they must enroll in intermediate algebra. If a student 
fails foundations in algebra, please do not schedule them for intermediate algebra until the student passes foundations in algebra. A student may not get credit for foundations in algebra and intermediate. One must be an elective credit. And the end of course test for algebra one must be administered at the completion of the second course intermediate algebra. Students are permitted to earn the physical education graduation credit through marching band, but the district must have an application approved by standards and learning. It's an innovative course application that they must fill out. It must document that all the appropriate standards for visual and performing arts and physical education are met. And if a student takes PE through marching band, he or she must take a separate health class. The South Carolina Honors Framework, um, it, it began in 2017-18, and all new courses that are assigned honors must meet the criteria in the South Carolina Honors Framework. The district needs to retain evidence that all honors courses meet this criteria, and they have to provide this evidence if we request it. No physical education class or um, PE, which is what I just said, including marching band and ROTC, um, may be eligible for honors weight. None of those courses are eligible. The transfer courses, um, when a student transfers in from a school in state, always look to the activity coding manual. The course code should already be on the transcript, but if it is not, please refer to the activity coding manual. Um, if it's an out-of-state transcript and no course aligns, then construct a transfer course code using the directions in Appendix M of the Activity Coding Manual. Please maintain a database of these transfer course codes so all counselors and administrators can refer to it and it's not duplicated. Students enrolling from non-public schools, which meet the accreditation definition as defined by Regulation 43-273, will have their credits accepted. And districts are encouraged to establish local board policy to address the non-accredited schools transfer grades and credit. This is not for the State Department to decide. It is a district established board policy. For early graduates, as we are all touching on in this webinar, um, fall, winter, and summer graduates, they will um, you can order diplomas for them using the early late feature in DOTS, and I'm going to go into specifics in that in part two of this webinar. Districts should ensure that parents and students are aware of the implications of graduating early because they will be excluded from class rank and thus scholarship eligibility. Counselors and principals must have a district design policy that clearly states that these students will be excluded from class rank. I get numerous phone calls from angry parents who were not aware that their students would not be eligible for scholarships because of this. Graduates who complete requirements at the end of the fall, winter, or summer term will not be included in the class count for class rank calculation scholarship purposes. And I know Sherry already touched on that. Power school administrators need to ensure that the exclude from class ranking checkbox is selected. Please make sure that you do check this exclude from class ranking checkbox. I get numerous transcripts all the time where summer and winter have class ranks, and this is extremely incorrect and will affect the class rank of the spring cohort. So a student who is an early graduate and wants to compete for scholarship can be active in the spring semester if he or she wants to continue courses through the high school, a Kate Center, or um, a college or university for dual credit. Um, this is an opportunity that counselors should present to students 
in case they do want to qualify for scholarships. And the last slide I have is something that Luis told me about numerous times. Um, some schools and districts keep early graduates as actively enrolled and um, they're counted in membership. These students are not enrolled in classes and they should not be receiving services. Therefore, these students are funded and this is an unlawful practice. Schools and districts are receiving funds through false membership count. So any early graduate must not be considered active. Some South Carolina schools and districts have policies or guidelines in place and they allow early graduates to participate in graduation ceremonies at the end of the school year. This is fine as long as they are not considered active in power school and you're not receiving funds for these students. So that is the end of my part and I'm going to turn this over to Luis. Okay, I'm going to try to click through some. <laughs> Hold on just a second. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm going to click through the slides beginning with power school topics for counselors. I understand part one is directed towards counselors and we're going to talk about proper coding uh, view a transcript that um, shows the difference between final and uh, a screen that shows differences between final and work in progress transcripts. We're going to talk about how to finalize your transcripts for archival purposes, and then we'll talk about the transcript templates and how you can get those made available to you. So let's take a look at this slide that shows us. I mean, you're very familiar with the the way the transcript is outlined the format itself when you print a paper copy or you print a pdf version now those of you who use the electronic versions um, through parchment know that the data elements or the, the values for the data fields are sent not in a direct format but they can print out of uh, some kind of um, pdf or paper copy on the end at the college or university when necessary. Looking at the very top of the transcript in a paper for, uh, format, you would see State of South Carolina Standard High School Transcript Final. This is the transcript at the end of the school year for each grade level, 9, 10, 11, and 12, that you want to make sure you store or archive for that record and then you should denote which grade level it is for that student. Now you can look at the transcript and you can see, but you want all of these files to be readily available in case you need them during the summer or 50 years from now. Looking again, you see in the top section, um, graduation, date, class of, diploma type. As Laura mentioned, often we find these fields are blank are coded improperly for some reason. Generally, that reason is the field in power school was not coded properly. When we look at those dates, we know that the um, the various fields come from core product, what we call core product power school, and we have custom fields that South Carolina has specified that are unique fields just to our state. And to know the difference, uh, your power school administrators know those differences and you would be able to talk with them. OK. Just to give you one example, the parts of a student's name you have in power school free form core fields where you enter the last name of a student. You see the little comma between the two cells on that graphic. And then you see first name and then on the bottom are generally in a, a larger um, screen. You would see all three of those aligned together on the same row, but you see middle school. Those are just the first, last and middle names. Lots of districts put middle initial there. 
if the child's birth certificate or legal document has a full name, you must put in the full name correctly spelled so that when diploma time arrives, you have the correct information that will be on your transcript and then moved over to diplomas. Notice that the slide uh, or the picture on your left hand side says South Carolina specific fields and those are some fields that are just specific to our state. Note the generation junior three and so forth is a drop down value and you would select from that drop down value the most appropriate um, generation designator I guess is the best term for a student. We realize that uh, fields, the, the common fields, last name, first name, address, parents name, all of those things are pretty um, easy to miss if you're not careful in, in review of data fields that are necessary. But those fields are, are, are needed for reporting on, on every angle from attendance to discipline to anything. So that those common fields are the ones that we expect that you have already populated correctly. For transcript purposes, however, we um, will, are trying to provide a chart that shows you not only the display name that you'll find on the page, graduation date, for example, but also which page you find that field so you can populate it properly. If you need to do a query, we've given you the internal field name, which is grad date for this particular field. And then we've given a slight description that will tell you what that field is for. And we've only given you eight of these out of the, the many um, fields that are applying to transcript information that you have to populate, the fields that you must have populated. But we wanted to make sure that we gave you a chart that gave you the most important ones that we see missing often on um, transcripts. Some of these fields are calculations. Look at GPA summary. Those are calculations. Once you submit the report to PowerSchool, those calculations are made on the fly and they're not stored anywhere. They're just made. So looking at those two, sorry, looking at those two, um, two screenshots, you see the eight fields that we've designated as um, most important to review or verify for information. The date is also uh, important. The letter date, letter dot date field, not only populates the signature for the principal, but it populates the date calculated. It's a system date and it requires that and, and it shows you that the date those reports were submitted for calculations or for printing purposes the system was on that particular date. So it just tells you when you calculate when the system calculated the GPA or the class rank or so forth. Note the difference between the WIP transcript and the final transcript. I think you know this, but we've had some schools inadvertently, somehow, mistakenly, whatever the question the situation might be, send to colleges and universities on a, um, just after the June 15th deadline, a work in progress transcript. How do they know it's work in progress? Because right in the title it says work in progress. In the top uh, screenshot you see final. That is the final transcript. There is no difference in the data values between these two transcripts. The difference lies in the title and on the bottom of the page I can get the right screen coming in. Um, on the bottom of the work in progress transcript, you see the current program uh, of courses that are lined up. The ones that students have not completed yet are, are listed in work in progress. Those are the only two differences. So at the end of the school year, when you print a work in progress transcript, <clears throat> It will look identical to a, a final, only it will have the label work in progress on it at the title point and at the, the box point for the text object at the um, in the middle on the right hand side. So colleges and universities are very, very aware of what they're supposed to get on transcripts from our schools in South Carolina. 
And if these transcripts do not align with their picture that they got from the Commission on Higher Ed, they will often call your school and tell you that they cannot accept that transcript for a student. Believe me, it happens. OK, so what do we mean when we talk about archiving a transcript? Um, counselors, you may not be responsible for this job in your school, but what we mean is simply that you are storing the final transcript by grade level. And this is each and every year, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, and back in the middle schools. Those students whose uh, course, courses uh, they're taking for credit also need to be stored at the middle school. And at the high school, there is a checkbox to include those middle school courses in the list on the transcript. So that's a very important uh, note to make. If you're you're not seeing middle school transcripts, you need to know that there's a checkbox that we need to help you find that needs to be checked. All right, looking on. I'm trying to scroll down and make sure I'm covering all my notes. We really want you, you at the at the school who's working with the transcript to work directly with PS district and school administrators to know if in fact there are specific written procedures that you have in place already. These procedures will help you provide consistent information across the board from from year to year from five years down the road. If you know how files were named, how records were named, you're going to be able to uh, go back and reference those reports and pull those reports from storage like Laura referenced. The process for archiving, we say these are some best practices that we would suggest. You always process the final transcripts after all grades are stored at the end of the school year. That's generally in the May June time frame. This year it will be a little later because of the late start for many schools. You will run the transcript and class ranking reports for all students by grade level. 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th. We keep in mind that beginning in the 10th grade, Palmetto Fellow Scholarship uh, determination can be uh, can reference the 10th grade transcript. A student can use or have um, the scholarship team use that trans that uh, 10th grade transcript to determine that. And we've already talked about this. Um, we put do this on before June 15th because that is the norm for the for a valid date calculated on a transcript. But for this year only, 2021, you will have through June 30th to calculate that um, transcript information and send it to colleges and CHE after June 30th. Timelines for transcripts. Um, after final transcripts are processed, you've got to store them so that you can retrieve those later. Laura emphasized she does not ever want to see a transcript printed from PowerSchool after the school year is over. You will not get a correct transcript. Think about the, um, the any change in any grade for any student. You can go in and change anything you want to, but you're impacting or you could possibly impact transcripts for every student in that grade level. So we suggest that you archive them, you set a date, a time frame uh, on which all transcripts will be, are, uh, all grades will be stored and all transcripts will be processed and, and then stored. That's archiving. We suggest that you save a paper copy in, in a student's record or folder. Many uh, districts say we don't do that anymore. Well, okay but we're just suggesting that you might want to do that by class, by year. It's easier to access those papers when a child comes in and says, I need my a copy of my transcript. Well, knowing full well that that's a copy they can have, but they can't give it to anybody else. A school must send a, uh, an accredited transcript 
to an institution for scholarship purposes or uh, college applications. Then we recommend that you store an electronic version, of, which is a PDF of a transcript in multiple places and, and know by procedural document where these places are. You may save it on a counselor's computer. You may save it um, on the server. You may save it uh, in uh, the district office. You, you probably want to have it stored in, a, in certain places, all labeled appropriately never to change those again because that's the one you're going to go pull for any request that comes in after the year is over. Again, we just put this here. Do not run new transcripts using PowerSchool after archiving those end of year transcripts. Early graduates, we've talked about many times. You've seen these notes. Um, but we need for you to remember an early graduate is an exception to the norm. Most students are going to finish their uh, coursework at the end of the school year in the spring. But those exceptions, <clears throat> after going and checking with the student and parent, making sure they understand the consequences or the positives, you're going to store all the student grades for the completed uh, coursework. You're going to exclude from class rank. There's a checkbox on the other information page. You select manually to recalculate the, the recalculation frequency. Recalculate now so that the appropriate information is uh, on all reports that may be printed at this point. Print the transcripts for the students, paper and electronically, and then store the record for those particular early graduates. Following that, you transfer those students out of the current school's database, moving them into the graduated school database by following the procedures in the uh, early graduate guide. Those are very specific. Transcript templates are not available to just anybody. There is a guide on our website at this link that provides you information about uh, transcripts in general. But if your school or district needs the template for, and it, the last one that was created and sent out was in 2018-19, uh, that specific transcript was updated to include the round calculation for, for um, GPAs. District level power school administrators, administrators must request this, um, the two templates, the work in progress and the final. And let me tell you, there's a lot of work that goes into form, uh, formatting those templates for each individual school in your district. You can send an email to powerschool at edsc.gov and we will be happy to send the transcript templates to uh, the persons. Of course, we check. We make sure that that um, a student doesn't hack into the system. If at all possible, we check. So it's important for those um, those templates to become to remain um, very secure in your system. OK, so for Power school for counselors, that's the end of my little set of uh, uh, slides. We want you to know that uh, we'll begin part two. And um, for any information on, on that we've missed, you have questions, you have this list of uh, email addresses to which you can send your questions. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. I, appreciate I appreciate your help, your help and yeah. hope you have a great, great day and enjoy the information. And if you have questions, as Louise said, you can consult us and um, we will be back on later for part two.